Good morning, everyone. Like Whitney said, my name is Grant Glover, and I am the interim high school minister and college director here at PCBC. Last night, I had the privilege of watching my younger brother, Luke, get married to his sweet wife, Bryn, here at Ellis Chapel. They both just graduated from Texas A&M in May. Thank you, do your thing. Uh, and let me tell you, these Aggies are built different getting married right outside of college. I'm 26 and went to UT. There it is. Okay, do your weird thing. So anyway, so that was a fun, a fun night and a late night. I am two cups of coffee deep, and we're going to get right into this thing, and we're ready to go. I did get to serve as the best man, so, you know, I had to stay there the whole time. But it was a good time. So we are continuing this morning in our uh, series in Galatians, and uh, this sermon is titled Freedom from Hypocrisy. And so as I received this title as what I'm going to be preaching on, I was like, of course, it happens to fall right from my brother's wedding. And this is, we're talking about hypocrisy. Because when you hear the word hypocrisy, I'm sure all sorts of things come to mind. You know, if you grew up in church, you probably think of the religious leaders in the Gospels, the Pharisees, uh, who act all religious and treat people terribly. And they're always the bad guys getting called hypocrites. And it's this nasty church word. Or... You think of your least favorite politician who in their campaign promises one thing and then when they get elected into office, just don't do that because they're there and they're good. And we like to think of hypocrites as like the bad guys and that our normal working definition of hypocrisy is to say one thing and then do another. However, this morning, what we're going to talk about, Paul's going to describe it in a slightly different way, and it's not quite as simple as good guys versus bad guys, because in reality, everybody wrestles with hypocrisy to some kind of extent, and it's much more subtle and subliminal than you might think. And how could that be? Let's find out. We're this morning, we're going to talk about what is hypocrisy And how can you be free from it? And the answer may not be what you're expecting. So we're going to look into Galatians 2, 1 through 14. So if you have your Bibles, you can turn there. We'll be in chapter 2, verses 1 through 14. And in it, we're going to see three things. Gospel freedom, hypocritical bondage, and consistent conduct. Gospel freedom, hypocritical bondage, and consistent conduct. So let's get into it. Galatians 2, 1 through 14, we're first going to talk about gospel freedom. We first have to see the kind of freedom that Paul is talking about here that if ignored and forgotten can lead to the hypocrisy he'll later talk about. And so to understand this freedom that we're going to get into this passage, this is the second part of Paul's autobiography. He's talking about these historical details that have happened, and you kind of have to understand what's going on here. So look down in verse 1 where you'll see that Paul says he went up again to Jerusalem with Barnabas, taking Titus along with me. Now, what's going on here is we're not quite sure exactly what event this is talking about. In Acts 15, there's this thing called the Jerusalem Council, where all the early church leaders came together and decided that Gentiles do not need to adopt all of the Jewish religious practices to become Christians. We're not sure whether or not Paul's referring to this event in particular here from his point of view, but what really matters is the specific issue he's talking about, and that's what will set up this gospel freedom that we're talking about. And you'll see in verse 2 what's going on. It says, I went up because of a revelation and set before them, the early church leaders in Jerusalem, though privately, before those who seemed influential, the gospel that I proclaim among the Gentiles in order to make sure I was not running or had not run in vain. So here's what's going on. The earliest Christians from the very beginning, the earliest followers of Jesus, think Peter and the other early disciples, early followers, they were Jewish. They were people who had grown up with the Jewish law, and they had all sorts of rituals and traditions and festivals and a culture. They abstained from eating pork. They didn't work on the Sabbath, all sorts of rules about that. And perhaps most importantly and fundamental to their identity was that they would have all of their male children be circumcised. And what's important to note is that they did this, the Old Testament advocated for this, 
not so that they can earn a relationship with God, but what they saw it as is that God made a covenant with us as his people, gave us this law, and now we do this in order to stay in the family of faith. But then Jesus comes along, who was Jewish, and he declares that now all that is necessary to be in relationship with God is simply accepting grace and accepting what has been done on your behalf. So, as this message begins to spread, it starts with Jewish people, with again the core message being you don't have to do anything to please God except to accept grace. A debate started. Do Gentiles, as they spread out from Jerusalem spreading this message, do Gentiles, the Greeks, the pagans, do they need to adopt all of the Jewish customs? Do they need to adopt all of the laws and the rituals and the dress and the attire? Do they need to become Jewish in order to be a full-fledged Christian? And Paul's answer was no. But what he's saying in verse 2 is that he went to Jerusalem to double check with the other important early church leaders to make sure that was okay and everybody was on the same page. And what he does is he brings Titus along with him, and that becomes significant in verse 3. If you look down, it says that even Titus, who was with me, was not forced to be circumcised, though he was a Greek. Quick historical side note, that could be TMI. To be circumcised as an adult male was taking a knife and... So you have to think Titus is going, thank God. (laughs) That's a relief. But there is more to it than just that. This was a massive ruling. This was radical at the time because the Jews were saying that Gentiles, any non-Jew, did not have to adopt a certain religious practice, a certain culture to please God. And this is huge because it flipped the entire narrative of religion, how it's been conceived from the beginning of time, whereas most religions say you have to behave a certain way, act a certain way, follow certain rules in order to please God, the gospel comes in and says you're free, and God declares you wonderful and acceptable and lovely because of work done on your behalf, and his mind's not changing about that. We can't please him with what we do. And we've talked a lot about that kind of freedom in this series in Galatians, this kind of psychological release of burden of pressure from having to please God by what we do. But I want to center in on a different kind of freedom today that can often be overlooked. And you're getting a hint of it so far in this passage, and it becomes a little more clear in verse 9. And if you'll look down, it says that these early Christian leaders, these early Jewish leaders in Jerusalem, gave the right hand of fellowship to Barnabas and Paul, that we should go to the Gentiles and they to the circumcised. The right hand of fellowship is essentially saying we are united on this front, and they realized something, that as they wrestled with this debate and wrestled with what Jesus did and what he taught, they realized that if the gospel has nothing to do with doing certain things to please God, and if they didn't have to add these rules and certain rituals, then that means that there is cultural freedom in the gospel. That there's cultural freedom, not just release from performing for God. There's actually a certain type of cultural freedom because if it's true that just accepting grace is all that is required to be in a relationship with God, then that means Gentiles don't have to become more Jewish to be Christian. It was radically transforming for the Jewish community. And even more than that, this is where Christianity, when you look at it holistically, differs from any other world religion that has ever existed. Because, and here's the thing, and we might wrestle with this in American evangelicalism, There is no such thing as Christian culture. It doesn't exist because the gospel is a simple message of acceptance and forgiveness and receiving grace bestowed upon you as a gift. And what what you see is that every other religion 
has never left its cultural center. Hinduism and Buddhism still has the majority of its adherents and its cultural center in Southeast Asia. Islam still has as its cultural center and where the majority of its adherents live in the Middle East. And Judaism still has Jerusalem and the land of Israel as the cultural center and where the majority of its adherents live. But Christianity is different. Christianity does not have one singular culture. In fact, it has shifted cultural centers and moved to different cultures throughout its history. So it first started in Jerusalem because that's where Jesus was teaching, but then it made its way to Rome, where Rome became the cultural center of the world and the cultural center of Christianity. But then as the Roman Empire began to fall, Christianity made its way west again and moved to more Germany, France, and England. And then over time, it made its way over to America with the Puritans and the pilgrims. And Christianity has always been on the move. And now, for the first time in history, the majority of Christians actually live in the Southern Hemisphere as opposed to the Northern Hemisphere. America is ceasing to become the cultural center of Christianity. It's actually shifting again to South America and Africa. And that's different than what any other religion is like. And notice with following that pattern is that Christianity tends to move away from sources of power. As Rome becomes more powerful, Christianity scatters to the more northern tribes, barbaric tribes throughout the rest of Europe. As England and France and those countries become more powerful, it shifts again to the lowly Americas at the time. And now as America has become more powerful, now Christianity's cultural center is moving to the third world in South America and Africa. The gospel is always, is always on the move because it's bigger than culture. It's not tied to one culture. It's actually a simple message that can be adapted to fit any culture because of how simple it is. There's not certain, certain ways you have to be in dressing in your culture to be a Christian. And here's why this matters for us in North Dallas. We have a hard time wrestling with this idea that there is no such thing as Christian culture. Because again, the gospel is simple enough to adapt to any cultural structure. Now, what I'm not saying is I'm not saying that there aren't certain practices we have to do or commands we have to follow in scripture when we become believers. There's plenty of that. I'm talking about cultural attitudes, cultural norms, because what we tend to do, especially in the Bible, Bible belt, is create Christian subcultures where this church dresses this certain way. We only have this style of music. We only listen to this kind of music. And Churches can't go out and interact and be in places where churches shouldn't go because we have our own little culture and our own little way of doing things. But if at the core of the gospel is a simple belief and a simple acceptance of grace, it's culturally flexible, and that means we have the freedom to adapt some of our cultural attitudes to reach people in this city. Because what's becoming difficult is that as secularism is making its way across America, people are beginning to look at Christianity and going, do I have to act like that to be a Christian? Like, do I have to enjoy spike ball and pizza parties? Like, do I have to wear the beanie and like the matching t-shirts? Is that like what I have to do? And the answer, of course, is no. But the rest of the country is looking at us going, what exactly does it mean to be a Christian? And with younger generations, they're becoming more disengaged with the church than ever before. And we have to be willing then, if that's true, to know that there is no Christian culture and we can drop and and identify certain cultural attitudes that we don't need to have anymore because there's freedom to So Gen Z, for example, is not interested in social events being located and centered at church. Whereas it used to be that people would be okay with coming to church and that'd be their social hub. Gen Zers like their community to be more authentic out where they live and they don't like to have their social life centered around church. They're also not interested in overly emotional worship experiences with lasers and smoke and all that. 
because it, to them, it feels like a production. It feels inauthentic, and they think they're being sold something. That's just kind of how they see the world, and they want their community, their friendships to be out where they live, out in their context, because they just kind of perceive the world a little differently, and this is why we launched a ministry called Off the Clock, which means Tuesday nights at the Angelica Movie Theater, and it looks very different than a normal church experience because it's not a church. But we make it a more casual environment because the whole point is that no, that our whole message is hopefully to those who are uncomfortable going to church that you don't have to adopt this certain Christian culture in order to become a believer. That the gospel is very simple. There's cultural freedom to be accepted no matter who you are or where you come from. And that is the cultural freedom in the gospel that is often overlooked And understanding this kind of cultural freedom, understanding this sets up the hypocrisy that the passage talks about and will help us better understand what Paul is getting at. So what we're going to talk about next is hypocritical bondage. Our second point, we're going to be talking about what hypocrisy is in this specific passage and how Paul identifies it not as freedom but bondage. So after this agreement that they made, that the Gentiles do not have to become more Jewish to become Christian, and after establishing that the gospel allows for cultural freedom and cultural flexibility, Peter ends up making a mistake that Paul had to rebuke him on. So let's look down in verse 11. But when Cephas, and that's Peter's Aramaic name, came to Antioch, I opposed him to his face because he stood condemned. Now that sounds serious. I mean, Paul is calling out one of the OG disciples, one of the earliest church leaders, one of the most famous figures in history, so he must have done something terrible. What is it? Verse 12. For before certain men came from James, Peter was eating with the Gentiles. But when they came, he drew back and separated himself, fearing the circumcision party. And on first glance, that doesn't sound so bad. It just sounds like Peter like exchanged lunch tables or something. What is the big deal? Why is Paul being so harsh? Well, listen to how he describes it in verse 13. And the rest of the Jews acted hypocritically along with him so that even Barnabas was led astray by their hypocrisy. He calls this behavior from Peter hypocrisy, which sounds harsh because, again, in our minds, we think bad guy, but here's what Paul's saying in that context. We have to kind of unload our own context and see exactly what Paul is saying here because the Greek word used for hypocrisy here means to create a public impression that is at odds with one's real purposes or motivations, and it was used in classical Greek and classical Greece to talk about actors performing on a stage, putting on a mask, pretending to be a character they're not. And that is the exact same word that is being used here. And so here's what's going on. Peter, while he was leading the church in Jerusalem, would eat with Gentiles whenever the congregation would come together. And that was a huge deal in that culture. One of the biggest ways you could bestow honor and friendship on somebody was to share a meal with them. And one of the biggest ways to insult people was to refuse to eat a meal with them. In that culture, meal sharing was incredibly important. And under Jewish religious practices, Jewish religious culture, Jews weren't eating with Gentiles. They weren't allowed to eat with Gentiles, at least so they thought, because they considered them to be unclean and their food to be unclean. And what makes this even worse for Peter is that in Acts 11, he receives a vision from God telling him to go preach the gospel to a Gentile. And he shows him a vision where he declares that all food is now considered clean and all people can be considered clean because of the gospel. And Peter knew that this gospel allows for cultural freedom, that Gentiles don't have to become like him to be a Christian. But when certain Jewish people 
came to see the church eating together and saw Peter eating with Gentiles, what Peter responded with was creating a public perception that he was a zealous religious Jew. That what he did was he put on a mask and in a moment, a moment of weakness, even though he knew it was deep down against his convictions, he wanted to create a public persona in that moment. And so this is what's going on. Peter knew the gospel, knew gospel freedom, and he knew that the gospel, as we've been saying this whole series, is Jesus plus nothing. But in a moment when faced with pressure, he wavered from his convictions, his deepest convictions. And so that's what we see about the truth of hypocrisy being taught in this passage is that it wasn't intentional. It wasn't malicious. There was no malicious intent. There was a good chance even that Peter did this so that Jews would judge him less in Jerusalem for becoming a Christian and better relate to him because he would be acting more Jewish and he might be, might be more acceptable. But in the moment, he became like an actor putting on a mask, creating a different public persona. And for a moment, he abandoned his deepest convictions in an emotional reaction to pressure. Quick side note. If Peter can get rebuked for wavering from his convictions, if he's one of the, who Jesus said, on this rock I will build my church, then there is grace for anybody who wavers from their convictions. Simple truth right there. Peter is a screw-up like everybody else. And this is where we see that hypocrisy is not so devious, not so malicious, but a momentary wavering from convictions in light of the pressures around you. And the point Paul tries to make here is that for Peter to abandon his deepest convictions about the gospel is actually to run from freedom to bondage. But to put on this mask is actually not freeing, but enslaving, and I'll explain it this way. There's a quote from George Orwell about hypocrites that says, a hypocrite is he who wears a mask and his face grows to fit it. In other words, because of pressures around, we begin to put on a persona and then grow into that persona because we're worried about what people around us are thinking about us. We care very deeply about our public perception, the court of public opinion. Our emotions are tied to how people think about us. And the moment that emotions and these societal pressures take over convictions, that's what hypocrisy is. It's a point of perception that goes against your deepest convictions about yourself and who you are. And the thing is, like I'm saying, is it's not so devious. It's not so malicious because it can happen to someone as innocent as one of my favorite characters in TV history, Michael Scott. Where are my Office fans? Surely everyone in here has seen it, and for the two of you who haven't, catch up. You're like 20 years behind. But anyway, Michael Scott, for the two that don't know who he is, is a boss who in reality has absolutely no clue what he's doing. I don't think he ever reads one business document the entirety of the show. He has no clue what he's doing running the regional branch of Dunder Mifflin, but he always pretends like he knows what he's doing, and it gets him in trouble a lot. Not to mention, his dating life is a mess. Every relationship is toxic as all get out, and his girlfriends treat him horribly, and you know this if you have seen the episode called Dinner Party. Yeah, there's 20 people in here know exactly what I'm talking about. It is the cringiest thing in television history. Go watch it tonight if you're feeling that kind of way. And his financial situation even is horrible because he signs this 30-year mortgage when he's like 50 for this crappy down home. And people are like, what are you doing? But he's always acting like he knows what he's doing and he has it all together. And that's why he's so relatable to us. He's always acting like everything's in control, putting up a mask and wanting everyone to think he's fine. And that's what we all like to do. We want to be seen as fine. We want to be seen that we fit in. And I really can't think of a better way to characterize North Dallas than this right here. Because we love masks. Dallasites love masks. We love 
slightly wavering on convictions to just please the crowd and make us seem acceptable to those around us. We desire desperately to fit in. We look around and say, well, what country club membership does that person have? I need to have it. I got to fit in. We look at how other people dress or the fashion they wear, and they'd be like, I've got to keep up. I've got to keep up with the trends, and I've got to become more like that. What car does that person drive? Nicer than mine? Unacceptable. I'm one-upping them. Or we look at the church down the road and go, how does that big church do things? Maybe we should be more like them. Now, again, it's not that any of those things are bad things, but when we're doing it to put on a mask, to create public perceptions, to desire to fit in into a culture and going along with the crowd, it can lead to bondage. Now, again, another quick note, what I'm also not saying is that it's bad to fit into a certain culture. I mean, I'm wearing a Peter Millar golf polo. Like, come on now. Like, I'm not saying that you never fit in with people around you. But what I am saying is that you're not trying to pretend and go against your deepest convictions about who you are and what your identity is by caring what those around you think and putting on a mask. There's nothing wrong with looking like those around you, but it's the moment that you let Jesus plus something enter your mind as your fundamental identity due to pressure that you fall from freedom to bondage because now you become a slave to the court of public opinion. And that's what we're saying is hypocrisy. It's not so devious. It's not malicious. It's just what we do when we feel the pressures around us of those watching us. And the whole point of the gospel is that what your heart yearns for and fundamentally needs is for you to be fully known and fully loved. To know that somebody unconditionally accepts you no matter who you are or what you do. And that's what the gospel says you have in God. It's like Augustine said, the fourth century theologian, that our hearts are restless until we find our rest in you. And as soon as we start to let those around us pressure us into adding something to our identity, our core beliefs of who we are in Christ and who God sees us to be, that I need Jesus plus something else to live a meaningful and purposeful life, we fall into the trap of wearing a mask to please those around us, going against our deepest convictions. And here's the thing. We're really good at doing this in a church context, too, because it's very easy to fall into the trap of Jesus plus my way of doing things is what Christianity is. But like we said earlier, there is no such thing as Christian culture, because if you can intellectually understand my first point, that the gospel brings cultural freedom, that Africans don't need to become more American to be Christians, if if we fundamentally understand that, The problem is, is that we grew up a certain way in church and we feel the pressure of those around us and we are used to certain traditions. And so what we do is we begin to think that our way of Christianity, like Peter, is the only way. His only experience was Jewish Christianity. He hadn't adapted to the new normal that there is now union between Jews and Gentiles. And it was the fear of public perception that was where the mask comes on. And what God wants us to see, what Paul wants us to see as well, is that this is not freedom, this is bondage. It can only lead you to think that, what it does, it'll just lead you to think that the only way God can effectively work is through this style of worship, these programs, this way of doing church, and looking this kind of way. But all of a sudden, when you restrict the gospel to a certain type of culture, that's not freeing, that's enslaving and restricting it actually. And the gospel is for all. Christianity is for all. It's flexible. And to succumb to the pressure of those around you and give up on that conviction of gospel freedom is to put on the mask of hypocrisy. And this is what we're saying that secular America needs to see is the simple nature of gospel truths, that you are fundamentally accepted and loved because God loves you. That's what what people need to hear. And if wearing a mask in this way is bondage, if this is hypocrisy, then how do we get to freedom? That will be our last point. 
we'll conclude with this, with consistent conduct. And it, that does not mean what you're originally thinking it means. When we're talking about consistent conduct, how a church and a people can become gospel-focused. And I want you to look at how Paul concludes his rebuke to Peter, and hidden in it is the release from hypocrisy. Look down at verse 14. But when I saw that their conduct was not in step with the truth of the gospel, I said to Cephas before them all, if you, though a Jew, live like a Gentile and not like a Jew, how can you force the Gentiles to live like Jews? To fully understand what Paul's saying here, what you, you have to understand the th word that means not in step, that your conduct was not in step with the gospel. And it comes from this Greek word, orthopedeo, and what this word means is to walk straight. And it's, this is actually the only time this word shows up in the New Testament, but we've dug up Greek papyri from the same time as the New Testament that sheds light on how the word was used. And how it was used in this, at this time was to describe kids who are beginning to get around on their own two legs without a nurse having to hold their hand to stop wa wobbling like little kids do when they walk, that that was to walk straight. And so notice what this means. Again, Paul's not saying Peter is maliciously abandoning the gospel, but he's allowing societal pressures to make him wobble in walking in it. He's wobbling. And if this is true then, then, then here is the freedom from hypocrisy, the freedom from mask wearing, consistent conduct. But here's not what I mean by consistent conduct. I don't mean that if you do the right thing over and over and over again, that's how you stop being a hypocrite. That's the good guy, bad guy dilemma. No, what I'm not saying is that you're not supposed to grit your teeth and rebuke yourself and feel guilty for being hypocritical. No, Paul's not grounding this rebuke of Peter in moralism because that's why he says it's not living in step with the truth of the gospel. He's not talking about a moralistic approach here because the gospel is radically opposed to the assumptions the world makes. That number one, there is no superior culture and there are no inferior cultures. And God is not looking for people to perform to earn his favor because the gospel in its essential core message just says that Jesus Christ, the son of God, has died on your behalf so that he could become your substitute, taking on the punishment you deserve for your failures so that you might receive the reward he deserved for his successes. And what that means then is that somebody else's work, what somebody else did, counts for your fundamental identity now. That you're actually considered wonderful and acceptable and lovely because of the work somebody else did. And then... The freedom from hypocrisy is then to bring your conduct, to bring your life, to be consistent with this identity. But the question, the key question is, how do you do this? How can you bring your conduct that is consistent with your deepest convictions about the gospel being the fundamental identity of your life now? Here's what you have to do. You don't beat yourself over the head. You don't beat yourself up. You preach the gospel to yourself daily because it makes no darn sense for God to look at us and love us, not because of what we've done, but because of what somebody else has done. And we will forget that by lunchtime, just about every day, that we're defined not by what we do, but what by some, somebody else did. You live in a world and a culture that tells you to look anywhere but God for a meaningful life. And every day you'll be pressured to wear a mask to please people. For my young friends, that means wearing a mask on social media. For others, it's to let your, what your coworkers think determine your actions. To waver from gospel truths and to succumb to the pressures of culture and to really illustrate what I mean by preaching the gospel to yourself, I'll end with a story. I told part of this story early in an earlier sermon about the great reformer Martin Luther, the guy who nailed a little note on that door of the Catholic Church way back when, if you remember from history class. And early in his life, he was a very zealous monk, and what he tried to do was be perfect. 
He felt the societal pressures of the medieval Catholic church to be completely holy, and he literally tried to eradicate all sin from his life and literally tried to beat the sin out of himself. That's what he did. But all of a sudden, upon reading Romans, grace strikes him like lightning, and he realizes that nothing I can do can earn righteousness, but actually righteousness of what Jesus did now counts for me. And his whole life is changed And he was convinced that the Christian life is not beating the sin out of yourself like he used to, but instead was to believe the gospel more deeply, to allow grace to seep deeper into the core of who you are. And here's how he says to have consistent conduct and to be free from wearing the mask. We'll end here. He says, Christians never completely understand grace themselves and thus do not take advantage of it when they are troubled and tempted. So we have to constantly teach it, repeat it, and work it out in practice. Anyone who does not understand this grace or cherish it in the heart and conscious will continually be buffeted by fears and depression. Nothing gives peace like grace. And that is what it means to have consistent conduct, to bring the inside in line with the outside, to let grace seep so deeply into the core of who you are that you realize that nothing you do anymore defines you, but what somebody else did. And that is the release from wanting to to act in hypocrisy, to wear a mask, to face societal pressures, and it allows for cultural freedom to be engaged in the church. It's all about believing the gospel more deeply. Let us pray. Father, thank you for today and for your word. And thank you that you sent your son to die on our behalf so that his work might count for ours. That we are not defined by what we do or what people think about us anymore. And that a bunch of Gentiles like us, those who are not Jewish, could be accepted because you call us acceptable because of the work Jesus did. Let us walk in this freedom to not feel the need to wear a mask and to realize that there is no pressure to be a certain way. And let your gospel go forth into the parts of the city where it is most desperately needed. And let us be a church that adapts ourselves to the culture of others so that we might be able to better reach them with this message. In your name I pray, amen.